Recording. All right. So I don't know what anybody's seeing as a participant. This is a problem. Do you want to maybe? I try them. Can't get in? It like, won't let me do it now that I am. Oh. And I don't know how we, oh, we have 88 participants so far. We can see you. Good to know. Hi, everybody. <laughs> Three people on the screen. So how do we, we just want speak review. Um, okay, 95 people. People are joining us. We're going to wait just a, a couple minutes here, I think, and let people get on board. Good morning, everybody. There's no audio. There's no audio? No, I'm not. Looks and sounds great to the others. There's no audio. Kaya? Kaya may have some problem with her own computer then. Yeah. Others are saying they can hear me. We're all sorting this out. So thanks for the comments to let us know. It's you can see us, hear us. Um, look at that, we're up to 111 participants and climbing. Exciting. <laughs> Heard and seen, looks and sounds great. Thank you, thank you, thank you, all the chat. Our numbers are going up. What do we give us, like another two minutes, three minutes? What do you think? Get started, yeah, okay. Well, people are joining. People are joining and they'll hear bits and pieces of the, the introduction, but uh, our numbers keep, it's like, a, it's like watching a clock here, this is awesome. Um, so welcome everybody to the scaled down version of our Intermountain Sustainability Summit. Very scaled down and very much virtual, but here we are. And uh, I'm Alice Mulder, for those of you who don't know me, I am the director of the uh, Sustainability Practices and Research Center at Weber State University. And this is, our office is the one that puts on the Intermountain Sustainability Summit, which for those of you who know it has become a really, um, critical um, event for our region and in such a wonderful time each year for people to come together to network, to share ideas. And uh, for those of you who have experienced it in the past, we are with you in missing that day when we're all really together, but are really happy that we've been able to at least provide something and are so pleased with um, our speakers today who have uh, been willing to, to carry on in this time. Um, we hope everybody's staying well and managing right in this time of coronavirus and earthquakes. Oh my, it's been quite exciting. Um, so as I said, with this webinar and the, the other, there's another one later today um, at one o'clock with Hunter Lovins. So I hope people will join for that as well. Our 100% uh, clean energies one has had to be canceled. The participants weren't able to join today for that. So, uh, but we will have this one and then another one at, at one o'clock today, 2.30 or 2.15, see how time goes. Um, but we're really happy to provide this place for people to come together. Um, even though we can't see everybody, we've got a way to at least to communicate together as a group. And when everything has been canceled left, right and center, we're really glad that, that we're able to, to do our best. We're trying to keep our distance from one another. Um, I have our team here. We're all six feet apart, really. <laughs> and uh, we're hoping we can share these ideas today and, and help bolster you, at least with this event that is going forward, and uh, bolster you with the critical work you do for our community and help provide you with a sense of grounding today, right, in this time of flux. Um, I also understand it is the equinox today, so that's a day of balance. I think it's a good day for us to all be here. So before I want to get we get started, I do want to thank our sponsors. Um, I'm going to try and share some slides here with you. <clears throat> so I'm hoping everybody is seeing slides. Um, Welcome to the summit. I should have had that one up earlier for us. But I wanna thank our sponsors um, and recognize everybody who has helped us this year um, bring the summit together, even though we didn't quite get to bring it to full fruition. 
but I, I have to tell everybody, right, it promised to be a, 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 a smashing year. We had so many people registered already and such an impressive lineup of speakers um, and attendees. So let me, let me thank these, these sponsors. It's really important. Thank you to our gold sponsors, um, Intermountain Healthcare, which has been an organization leading in sustainability and has done a lot this, in this past year to reduce its environmental impact. Also to UCARE, which for those of us in Utah are very familiar with this uh, critical organization, plays a, has played a crucial role in convening um, clean air partnerships across the state and really helping move the needle and work to improve our air quality uh, issues here. Our silver sponsors have included Legrand Wattstopper, which is one of the uh, businesses that's helped us here at Weber State to increase our energy efficiency, Catalyst Magazine, um, which keeps our community informed and reports so well on sustainability matters for, the, for our community here. The College of e Engineering, Applied Science and Technology here at Weber State, which is working, of course, to provide education, training, and technology for our future leaders and for those who are retraining, retooling for the green economy. And um, our bronze sponsors, many of these, um, GSBS Architects, the Weber Morton Health Department, um, Ogden Sustainability Community Committee, sorry, a new committee that's uh, formed within the last year. Interface, which is where you're going to hear from uh, Mikkel is from. Thank you, Mikkel. And Interface, Lucid, BCBO Architecture, Grounds for Coffee, uh, Union Grill, and Weber State Credit Union. We also have friends of the, stu the summit, Sodexo, his, who is our food provider here. They were going to be providing us China this year again, had we all been clinking glasses together. Um, new Skin. Utah Climate Action Network, Intermountain Events, and Salt Lake City Green. And I don't want to miss um, recognizing the Weber State sort of family who has been um, helping to support us. We are housed under academic affairs here at SPARC, but um, the College of Science, College of Education, the College of Social and Behavioral Sciences, the Talitha E. Lindquist College of Arts and Humanities, Stewart Library, have all helped support the summit, as well as the Energy and Sustainability Office, the Facilities Information Service, Office of the President. President Brad Mortensen welcomes everybody as well. You would have seen him this morning had we been here in person um, at the Diversity Office and the Honors Program. So thank you so much to all of them. So our session today is Culture Shift. Um, the, the title's transformed from what it was. Um, our uh, Edward D. from the Navajo Nation was not able to join us today. Um, he's taking care of himself and, and family and tribal matters. So fortunately, we, we, we still have Mikhail and Rob Davies. Um, so I'm going to introduce both of these people. And just so you know, we will have time for, for questions and kind of Q&A via the chat. So do make use of that. Um, Mikhail is going to start and then be followed by, by Rob Davies. So let me start by introducing Mikkel. Mikkel is Director of Technical Sustainability at Interface, um, a world-leading modular flooring company. Mikkel is responsible for advancing Interface's mission in the Americas by building inter internal leadership capacity, facilitating strategic alignment of, of, alignment of efforts and creating external partnerships that shift the marketplace towards sustainability. Previously, he served as manager to environmental icon David Brower and spent five years with Blue Sky Sustainability Consulting, building sustainable business strategies for Fortune 500 companies. Um, I think you're all in for a treat. I met Mikkel at the, um, a conference earlier this year, both Bonnie Christiansen and I did, and we were so impressed um, and excited that he was willing to come and join us for the Intermount Sustainability Summit. All right, let me stop sharing this. And Mikkel, I will turn it over to you. Great, thank you, Alice. Uh, thank you, everyone. Great to be joining you virtually. The, uh, I think we can all see that uh, one of the things that we are going to experience in, in this era is disruption. And we're going to have to learn a lot about how to make the most of it. And so I'm so happy that the summit hasn't been canceled and that we have decided to, to stay connected even as we are being socially distanced. The, um, the story I wanna, I wanna share with you today uh, and that we'll get into a discussion is about the, the company I work for, Interface. And uh, I know we have Hunter Lovins coming up later who can tell you probably 
some even more intimate details of the, uh, the transformation of this company from a very run-of-the-mill plastic flooring manufacturer into something I would say much more meaningful and important for the world. And uh, so Interface, when I, I first encountered it, I was an environmental science student in California in 1997. My first encounter with Interface was going to a conference on in what was then the unlikely conjunction of environment and business. And the, this conference, the Ecotech 3 conference, uh, promised to bring together ideas of environmentalism with ideas of how to run successful businesses. Um, so I was kind of interested. I was about to finish a degree in environmental science and had been basically learning about all the world's problems and not nearly enough about the solutions. And so moving into that, I, uh, one of the early keynote speakers was a guy named Ray Anderson, who I would come to know as the founder and CEO of Interface, uh, which was certainly a company I'd never heard of and most people hadn't either, because we, uh, Interface sells commercial carpet tile. They invented selling carpet in squares and rectangles instead of in rolls. Uh, that was as uh, radical as they were at the time. But in, in 1997, I saw Ray Anderson, and I was frankly a bit skeptical. I, I come from uh, very rural Northern California, where it was an area where we were in the midst of seeing the, uh, the mostly timber-based economy collapsing. We were seeing the, the last dregs of the old mills being bought up by out-of-state companies, liquidating, you know, broadcast spraying herbicides. We were seeing the, the economy destroy the environment in my home county, um, and no one really looking out for the long-term future of the economy or the environment. And so here we, we, you know, when I, the county I grew up in was owned by, we had a, almost a half of our land area was owned by two companies from the Southeast, Georgia Pacific and Louisiana Pacific. And so here comes a, uh, another CEO from Georgia, Ray Anderson of Interface, gonna come tell us about the environment. And I was like, whoo, this ought to be good. I was a little skeptical to say the least. <laughs> and Ray proceeds to say the one thing that could have really gotten my attention, which is that he recognizes just how big the overall environmental problem is, and he recognizes that he caused it the way he made his money. Here he is, he's the American success story, son of a postman who rises to become a you know, Fortune 500 CEO, multimillionaire, drives a Bentley. Um, it's exactly what you're supposed to do in American business. Three years before that, uh, meeting Ray, he had this life-changing epiphany. We started with a very simple question. Customer wanted to build a green building and said, well, is your product green? What is your company doing for the environment? And he didn't have a good answer. And he liked to be very responsive to customers. That was how he had built such a successful global business to that point. And he didn't have an answer. And it led him to, to look into this. He was always a learner and a reader. And he ended up reading Paul Hawkins' book, The Ecology of Commerce. And it just sort of broke apart. It disrupted him. It disrupted him. And that is one of the things that is so amazing about this time of disruption is that you cannot have transformation without disruption. But it was a sort of dark night of the soul type disruption of what have I been doing with my life? Has this whole apparently very successful life and business of mine actually been just destroying the earth and destroying the basis of future prosperity for my grandchildren? And that is, is from where all of the other things, this mindset change, this disruption, this personal transformation, this ethical dilemma, you know, as Ray liked to say, and he said in this talk, which I heard him give in, in California in 1997, he was a self-convicted plunderer of the earth. And the other next thing that caught my attention is this phrase he said, and this ended up on the cover of, I think, Fortune magazine, I believe that one day people like me will go to jail. And what he meant by that is that, that people like him who had made all of their wealth by essentially robbing you know, resources and prosperity from the future, by paying no attention to the sustainability of what they had set in motion. 
And so I left that first talk with Ray actually very hopeful. And why I was hopeful was because if that kind of transformation could occur and that someone who was, I thought of as definitely as an environmental science student who had grown up in an, in an area where we really had seen irresponsible management of the land and the resources and, and eventually the destruction of the local economy, if someone like that could change, what, was it, what else was possible? If business could take another course, could devote all of this you know, innovation and money and resources and leadership to reconciling our relationship with the earth, what else could be possible? Um, so I, I ended up about six months later getting to, uh, to go to some of these meetings that Hunter Lovins and others were at. Uh, where we really were sitting down at Interface headquarters discussing how can we transform this resource intensive, essentially, you know, fossil fuel powered company makes plastic flooring into a change agent and completely transform it into a company that shows business a better way to do business. What Ray Anderson called a bigger, better profit. He was very much a capitalist, very much still interested in making money, but he wanted to show business that they could make money in a better way, in a way that didn't undermine our future prosperity, in a way that actually, if we got everything right, could actually restore the earth rather than diminish it. So we actually just, you know, that was 1994. Last year, we, we celebrated 25 years of being on this mission. And I think for our topic today, one of the key things that Ray, having had this personal, he was the CEO, but that didn't change, the fact that he had a mind shift didn't change the culture of the company overnight. Um, some of the people who were around then actually have been very, I love how honest they are, you know, some of them, and I, and I can't replicate their awesome, you know, Georgia accents, but, uh, you know, one of, one of the, the quotes is like, yeah, back then, our first response was sympathy because we all love Big Daddy Ray. That was what a lot of people called him. It was very much a family culture. The CEO was kind of the dad. And uh, we all love Big Daddy Ray, but it was quite clear he lost his mind. <laughs> so they were, not, um, they were not enthusiastic at first. They were worried that this, this big change that suddenly Ray is talking about how you know, our business is destroying the earth and we have to change everything and become the world's first sustainable and then restorative enterprise. The engineers were, you know, had smoke coming out of the earth. It's like, he wants us to design a perpetual motion machine, you know. Um, so Ray really spent the first three years of this journey. He spoke about it externally, which was mostly, his speech was a mea culpa, which was the speech I heard. He didn't have any news to report in terms of how they had changed the business at that point, other than that he was starting to change the culture. He was going around and he gave some talks externally, but mostly he was giving talks to every employee in the company, telling them about sharing his story, sharing his personal epiphany, sharing how he intended to transform the company. In early days, he did not necessarily know if he was getting through, and then he started to get some traction. There's a wonderful uh, poem that one of the, called Tomorrow's Child, if you, if you Google Ray Anderson, Tomorrow's Child, you'll, you'll see him reading this poem, which one of his employees wrote after one of these talks, which was Ray described as one of the most encouraging moments in his life because it was people had started to get this culture shift where they were talking about what is the impact of how we run our business today on tomorrow's child, you know, that child who has not yet been born, but what if we ran our business with tomorrow's child in mind? That would be transformational. So, we, you know, in 1997, and this was something, again, Hunter Levins and others participated in, they, we did a global meeting, which was essentially the meeting that said, this is not going away. This is the new, this is the mission. We had over a thousand employees <laughs> gather together and, uh, and immerse in this new culture of sustainability. And that is one of the things I will say is that in order to transform culture, we have to invest in it. This, this meeting was a huge investment, but it was this immersion experience where a thousand people, mostly salespeople from all over who hadn't really thought about this stuff, were sitting there and John Denver wrote a song and there's Hunter Levins and Paul Hawken and all of these, these famous people sharing their perspective on the world and how we need to come together and transform our company. And, and Ray, when he was giving talks to 
to people within the company, the way he, in a nutshell, he put it, he just said, you know, here, here's what I'm asking you. You can come to work every day to make carpet, or you can come to work every day to make history. You get to choose. And that was the fundamental disruption that he was offering is that we are redefining what our company is about so that it matters. We are redefining, we, are, we have no idea, and this was the great thing about it, had no idea. They said, we're gonna have zero negative impact on the environment. They had no idea how to do that. That was a huge cultural shift. Manufacturing people are used to, we figure out how do we do something efficiently and do it over and over and over again, as opposed to taking on challenges that seem technically impossible and having to invent you know, out of thin air or something new every day. It's very different than the normal manufacturing mindset. So huge um, shift. There was already some, some culture around innovation because we were trying to disrupt this world of rolls of carpet, but pretty small compared to disrupting this world of unsustainable business. And so there's, a, there's an interesting old uh, saying, I don't know who to attribute it to, um, but the culture eats strategy for breakfast in business. So every business needs a strategy, you know, a long-term view of how do we become profitable and grow over time. But if you don't have an outstanding culture in which people are engaged and supportive of this mission and the strategy, you know, your strategy won't matter as much. And so this has been the amazing thing from a business perspective for Interface is having this culture where people actually care and see that whatever I do within this company, we have a chance to make history, not just make carpet, um, has really been transformational in terms of the, the levels of, of turnover within the company are, are relatively non-existent, even within the manufacturing organization, which is very unusual. Um, people want to be part of this. And that is, that is certainly, you know, you, you can hard to put dollars and cents on it. <laughs> Thank you, Hunter, yes. <laughs> culture eats strategy for breakfast correctly as one might guess attributed to peter drucker um the other thing i will i will mention in terms of the culture shift the other book so paul paul hawkins book the ecology of commerce where he basically lays the destruction of the biosphere at the foot of business and says this is when what, the way we have grown our economy is one of the main causes of the destruction of ecosystems but he also says the only thing he sees that could solve this is business. Business is the only institution that he sees as capable of solving the problem that it helped. You know? And so that was a very powerful idea to Ray, to how do I make my business into part of the solution? The other book he read that was very transformational and very important to this larger idea of culture was Ishmael by Daniel Quinn where he essentially takes this old idea of the alien anthropologist, which in this case is played by a talking gorilla, um, who views the whole history of humanity from this outside lens and shows how did we get to where we are today in terms of what are the hidden assumptions within our culture that have led us to damage the earth as we have. And so I would recommend that book and any of Daniel Quinn's, Quinn's books. So someone who really, lots of provocative ideas, you aren't gonna agree with all of them, but Daniel Quinn really challenges some of these foundational tenets of our culture that are actually invisible to us, which is the nature of culture, because it becomes invisible to you. And we don't even actually see what our assumptions are because they are assumptions. It's just the way we are. Um, so when we're in these moments of disruption, it's a chance to really question our assumptions. And I think that's you know, where we are today with uh, you know, CO, uh, the COVID-19 issue. But I think we have to look for the opportunities. How do we question our assumptions in this? How do we create a culture that really is more intentional, that takes into account the climate crisis, that takes into account you know, our effect on other species? Um, you know, that is one of the things Daniel Quinn calls out that is inherent, that we are superior to all other species is an assumption in our culture that is deeply seated and informs behind the scenes all of what we do and how we make decisions. So I think it's one, one of our opportunities in, because this, this crisis has suddenly disrupted everything. How do we emerge from this disruption, not just disrupted, not just dislocated, but actually transformed in a way that we wanna be just transformed. And that was what, you know, what Ray took the opportunity of being disrupted to really transform us into a much better company, into a much more meaningful company.
into a company that we're not known. We're, we sell to other businesses. We sell to to other, you know, whether it be higher education or corporate. We sell carpet to other businesses. You know, we now sell other kinds of flooring. But we're not known, and yet within the world of people looking for this sustainable economy, we're very well known because we took a leadership stance. We took on, and I want to see if I can share with you a slide real quick, just because this is uh, in honor of our uh, 25th anniversary of taking on this mission, because we had existed for 20 something years before. Rather than issue a report about all our accomplishments, we issued a report about what we felt like we had learned that we would presume to share with the rest of the world. So we took on this mission zero. We were trying to have zero negative impact on the environment. But that really was only just the beginning, it turned out. This is this the first impossible goal. And so last year, we, we declared success on that. Every metric made it to exactly zero. We got very close because we realized that the larger challenge is around reversing climate change and taking on this biggest challenge. And this is one of the things that transformed in our culture is we got really comfortable with this idea that our mission has to sound impossible. And so that when, we did a, when we were going to formulate the new mission, that was the number one piece of, of feedback we got from employees all over the world, because we're a global company, was the new mission has to sound impossible. So this, was, this is where we got on Mission Zero. We got all of these wonderful metrics. And the thing I like to point out about this, especially in the context of this conversation, is you could latch on to Mission Zero as this series of technical innovations, which it was. All of these things required amazing innovation. But it started with a mindset shift and a culture shift. And that's really where what, what we have to, it doesn't start, we could say, oh yeah, let's put on another solar panel, let's invent a better widget. But it starts with questioning our assumptions, questioning these assumptions that underlie our culture, because that's what leads to this more profound innovation. And until we see what these assumptions are and make them visible, we won't ever get to these sorts of amazing numbers. You know, this is our role, I feel like, in, in some of these corporate sustainability circles that are saying, well, we just hit our 2020 goal to reduce greenhouse gas emissions by 15%. Like, great, we reduced ours by 96%. More is possible. And that, that is, I think, the role of our company. There's, there's plenty of work to be done getting people who are doing nothing to be doing something. Our role now is to stretch the realm of the possible and to say, you can set goals that sound impossible uh, and keep innovating, and you'll be an even better, more profitable company for that. So I'm not gonna show the whole report, but essentially we, we distilled this down into, into nine lessons. Shoot for the moon, you have to set these impossible goals. Changing mindsets, you have to invest in changing mindsets. It's not enough just to change technologies or, or business structures. Um, every vision needs a plan. You, you, we have to say, okay, so we have this vision of how we're gonna achieve something new. We actually have to have a plan of how that gets done. Circular approach, the circular economy is absolutely essential. We can't just keep pulling materials out of the earth and throwing them in a landfill. To change everything, you need everyone. We have done so much work to engage other businesses, especially our suppliers, but also um, if we don't invest in actually shifting minds beyond our company, there won't be an appetite for what we're gonna deliver on sustainability. Um, a wrong turn can lead to the right result. We have to be patient with failure when we're pursuing these big innovations. Be transparent. We shared the bad news from day one. Uh, and that's one of the things I'm, I'm very impressed with Interface. Very contrary to most corporate communications. You know, our goal is 100% renewable energy. We are at 0%. That was literally what we shared. That is not the norm for corporate reporting. And it certainly wasn't in 1995. Um, but that is how transparent we need to be. Some of the stuff on the circular economy right now, that's where we are. We can say, oh, well, I got 10% recycled content. You know, and I can guarantee you, and our product is 100% recyclable. How much of your product actually gets recycled? We actually published that metric in this report, 5%. <laughs> so, which is probably both world-class and totally pathetic, but we won't advance unless we are transparent. You know, in 1996, that's where we were on renewable energy. Now we, it's very easy to say, oh, we're at 88%, you know, because we look good. 
on the circular economy and product take back, we're taking back 5% of what we sell. We don't look good and we still have to publish that metric and be transparent because that's how we innovate. That's how we see what the gap is. So lesson eight, start a ripple, create a wave. We've always had this awareness so that our larger impact would be in these ripples we caused in other businesses, influencing companies like Walmart, you know, any company that came to us and said, gosh, how are you doing what doing in sustainability? We would invest in helping them get on their own path to sustainability. And that's probably had a much larger effect than anything we did to change our own business. And then finally, raise the bar. We have to keep, keep delving into this you know, amazing realm of the impossible. Um, you know, so shoot the moon, we need to keep shooting for the moon. You know, so we, we've gone from, okay, mission zero, that sounded impossible, a zero negative impact environmental, you know, zero negative impact from a manufacturing company sounds impossible. Okay, now our goal is to reverse climate change, at a profit, scalable, and show the world how to do that. Um, so again, we have to get comfortable shooting for the moon and keep raising the bar. And that's a good thing. It'll be good for business. So I am going to stop there because I think I've given you an idea of, of, of the shift that we created, but it really started with this culture shift and, and, and seeing, making visible our assumptions and changing how we were thinking about you know, who we are and what is our place in the world. I'm going to stop sharing. Okay, thank you, Michaela. <clears throat> that was wonderful. Uh, we're all just getting goosebumps in here. It's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I just wanted to say a couple of things for, for everybody who's in attendance. I know that there have been a few hands raised, uh, or at least a couple. Um, we're going to wait and have Rob speak first, and then we will do, do um, take questions from the chat. We can also, you can raise a hand, and I can give permission to people to, to hear our, their voices. Um, so we'll see how that works, but, but hold your questions, note them down so you remember what they are, um, and then we'll come back together for questions after Rob is, is done. All right, Rob, are you ready? You need to unmute yourself, there we go. I am ready, thank you. Okay. Mikkel, you may wanna mute your, um, well, I don't know. So, Rob, are you speaking? And then, then maybe there'll be some conversation between you. That can go. That can happen too. So, sure. Okay. Uh, okay. Um. Well, uh, first of all, again, Alice and Bonnie and everybody who's put this together, thank you for sticking with this. I concur with Mikkel that it's such a uh, important thing, and I think you said this really well, Mikkel, um, in this time of social distancing that we still come together. Um, and I'm looking at the, there are 188 people participating in this, which is just fabulous. Um, so wishing you all well, uh, I'll say right up front that it turns out that I am utterly physically incapable of not touching my face. So that's going to happen. In fact, right now, um, uh, I, uh, let me just start with my very personal, a uh, very quick personal story. So, um, Mikkel said that he became aware of Ray Anderson in 1997, who had been doing his work since I think 1994. Um, and, then in 19, and that's when Ray recognized that, um, I'm just reading this here, that the environmental problems were huge and that he was the cause. And I, I think I wanna say, so my training is in uh, the sciences in physics uh, originally. And in 1994 and 97, I was in graduate school uh, getting a PhD in physics. And at the time that Ray Anderson was realizing that, that these problems were enormous and he was the cause, um, I realized exactly nothing at that point. And so as we're talking about this, this notion of shifting our culture, I, I, I'm constantly fascinated and horrified by this fact. I don't necessarily hold myself fully responsible, partially of course, but it's possible to be spit out the very tippy top still of our educational system with say a PhD in physics uh, from the ivory tower and not understand where our water comes from, not understand where our waste goes, not understand um, 
the most basic things of what it takes to live uh, well and equitably, equitably and non-destructively on the planet. Um, so, uh, so that's where I was in 1997. Um, I didn't really start doing this kind of work, working in global change, uh, climate change, until 2007. And since then, I've been, I think many of you know, uh, I initially started in climate change education. But that quickly grows, of course, when you find everything's connected to uh, the food system and the energy system and the economic system and then social systems. Um, and so certainly I say what I do today is global change. With that said, I have no particular expertise in, I think, what it takes to shift a culture. I'll simply say that I love that this uh, conference this year was focused on this notion of shift and is emphasizing cultural shift, because certainly that's where I've come to in uh, the work, in thinking, trying to think deeply and hard and, and reading those who have thought deeply and hard about how we need to get where we are. So with that as prelude, very briefly, let me say that um, we're often uh, thinking in terms of, I think many in this room, of the climate crisis uh, and, and the emergency that we now face and what does it take to meet that emergency. And certainly there is a shift necessary for the crisis. Um, but I think what I want to emphasize more today is the shift that's necessary even beyond that crisis, which is a much longer term cultural shift. And in the talks that I give these days, I, I end uh, the last 10 minutes or so are typically spent on a notion of mindset and how uh, when you accept a mindset of emergency, uh, what is viable changes. And I think, of course, uh, and I often use the, the large events, global events of the 1930s and 40s as an example. Uh, this past week, of course, we, <laughs> I don't need to go back that far. I mean, could anybody imagine that what is now happening across our nation and across the world, but certainly in our culture right here in the United States, even a week or two weeks ago, certainly two weeks ago, we, none of us would have thought that this is where we would be uh, with um, uh, whole major sections of the economy essentially shutting down, slowing, people staying at home. Uh, uh, and all of that that we've been living through. So I think this is a very immediate example of how a mindset of emergency can very dramatically shift uh, what we perceive as viable and reasonable, reasonable versus radical. Uh, when I give these talks, the oftentimes, um, and oftentimes, as I said, I'm using World War II as an example of uh, large changes in behavior to meet a crisis. And uh, a classic example is the fact that uh, we in the United States outlawed the manufacture and sale of new automobiles, which uh, certainly would be inconceivable outside the notion of an emergency, and then done almost immediately inside the notion of an emergency. And the response I often get is, well, what is it going to take for climate change? For what is our Pearl Harbor moment, so to speak, for the United States, or maybe for Britain, it's their, their Dunkirk moment? that uh, takes those things that we weren't willing to do and makes them into things that we're just, we're all coming together to do. And, and this is the notion of a, of a shift in mindset to meet an emergency. And certainly much of that happened in the United States. We, uh, you know, many, many things were rationed. Uh, everything was recycled. We had uh, war bonds and, and victory gardens and the list goes on and on and on of the many dramatic shifts. But the point I wanna make here is that um, even though these we accepted dramatic changes for a time to meet a crisis, I think the idea in everyone's mind was that these are emergency actions, and once we're done with the emergency, once that's been met, we go back to normal. And it's, certainly that is the case uh, with the events of the 30s and 40s, and in fact, um, at the exact same time, uh, the Allies were fighting um, this horrific, oppressive regime, the Nazis, uh, the British continued their empire and horrific, oppressive uh, policies throughout their empire. Uh, certainly the Caribbean, certainly India, um, France doing the same thing in Africa, Belgium, 
doing the same thing uh, in Africa. Uh, you know, at the same time, we feel like we're taking these actions to meet an emergency created that we feel by a terrible, awful regime, the Nazis. Our own culture really was to continue those same practices elsewhere in the world, uh, even during the meeting of the emergency in World War II and afterwards. Um, and of course now, uh, and certainly here in the United States, an example of Jim Crow was, was just uh, at, at, we were at peak Jim Crow in the 40s and 50s. Um, so the notion is that our culture really didn't change. Our mindset for the time being to meet an emergency changed. And certainly, uh, I think we all understand that that needs to happen, certainly with coronavirus, COVID-19, and also with climate change. But moving past that, the notion of a shift in culture is, uh, I think, unavoidable. Um, we currently have a food system that produces enormous ecological damage and not terribly healthy people. Uh, we have an economic system from which that food system has emerged uh, that on a much broader scale than just the food system produces enormous ecological damage and enormous social damage as well. And so this is the, I guess the bumper sticker that has really stuck with me. And I have my wife, Rebecca McFall, to th uh, the other day we were talking about this and she says, what it boils down to is how we treat our home emerges from how we treat each other. And uh, certainly she's not the first to express that sentiment, but uh, for me, it really hit home when she said it in just that way. How we treat our home emerges from how we treat each other. And the challenge that we have at the moment, I think, is that we need structures within our society to help get us there. Um, the systems that we have have emerged from our culture, a food system, an economic system, a, a health system, a transportation system uh, that wreak enormous ecological damage and create enormous social problems uh, and challenges as well. Um, these systems have emerged from our culture. And I want to rephrase that as from what we have chosen to value most. Uh, these systems emerge from what we choose to value. And what I think is even more fascinating this is what we have chosen to value most as reflected in the institutions that have emerged in the structures that have emerged. What we have chosen to value most as reflected in these institutions is not what we claim to value most. Um, um, personal relationships and, uh, and uh, personal happiness there are so many examples of this, but of course the, the food system emerges from valuing uh, profit. The economic system e emerges from valuing growth and the notion of growth is, it comes from, we have no concept in our current culture of enough, uh, only more. But when, we, when you take polls, people claim not to value these things. They claim to value the more personal uh, things that just make us happy on a day-to-day -day value. So this suggests to me that our task, in large part, is reconnecting ourselves as a society uh, to who we already want to be, um, but somehow are not. And so the question is, why aren't we being this? And I'll come back to this notion of uh, structures in our society that have now emerged to sustain themselves. And that is the structure of our um, media system. And one media outlet in particular, I think, is emblematic of a whole section of that. And of course, that's the, the Fox uh, Not News Disinformation and Propaganda Network, uh, which over the past 38, 30 years has created of our society uh, that is uh, essentially operating on a completely different epistemic based one that is full of rage, one that is misinformed. Uh, it was dull that, that uh, actually treated it like a drug addiction. There's a fabulous article about how Roger Ailes put together the, this system uh, to just hook people and get them hooked on rage and hooked on that adrenaline hit when you put in the gotcha moment to something you've just told people to hate. Um, 
And of course, where that whole system emerged was let's, the whole point was to build up an audience, build up a viewership through the advertising. Uh, it's just for profit. So where it's led us to today, of course, uh, is that we can exist in the midst of an emergency in which many people across the country still insist that this is a hoax, that it, the coronavirus is nothing really. And, uh, um, and I think we've all seen that play out. So this is one structure that is moving us heavily in a direction towards things that we claim not to value. Uh, the question is, how do we reform those structures so that they move us back to uh, things that we do value? And then we can start to reverse or at least contain these ecological and social crises. Uh, and I'll make one comment here is that it took me uh, an embarrassingly long time to fully understand and internalize the notion that the ecological and social crises are fully intertwined at the molecular level. And again, that, that statement that how we treat our home emerges from how we treat each other, I think is very, uh, states that very succinctly. These, these are inextricably entwined. Um, so what are some examples of, just a couple of more examples, and then I'll, we'll open it up for discussion. I think I'll be ready. But as I look at things, and let me reemphasize that I, I don't consider myself an expert in this at all. Uh, I read a lot of people, uh, anthropologists, uh, sociologists in particular, who've been thinking about these things much longer than I have. But as I look at what's happening, a couple of things that occur to me is this. For example, when I say that we don't live in a way that expresses the values that we claim to hold highest. So the first is this notion of a no limits living. Um, this is a highly prized in our, in our current culture that we want to arrive at a place in our lives where we can have whatever we want, whenever we want it. We can travel wherever we want, whenever we want to, no matter the cost to other people, no matter the cost to uh, landscapes, no matter the cost to other creatures. Um, and this is drilled into us through systemic advertising. Uh, what even the most, uh, what we might think of as the most erudite intellectual sorts of things, open up a, um, uh, open up a New York magazine or a New Yorker, and you'll still find advertisements telling us to buy the luxury car and to travel to the luxury resorts, uh, no limits living. And of course, what that de-emphasizes, uh, or the, the subtext is no responsibility living. We keep emphasizing personal freedom over personal responsibility and corporate freedom over corporate responsibility, even though when asked, we claim not to value those things. Uh, we claim to value the opposite ordering. Uh, so I, I guess I will, I will conclude with the notion that what I do now, what I spend a lot of time doing is in addition to teaching a regular introductory physics class, the, the class that I've been developing over the last few years that I'm, uh, I'm most excited about is a course that I teach for humanities and fine arts students here at Utah State University called Unveiling the Anthropocene. It's a science course for them. Uh, I try to introduce the whole, the whole concept of the impacts we're having on the planet, the systems from which these impacts are emerging. Uh, the human outcomes from those systems and all of the data that we have that, that tells us this, and then ask the students to start envisioning, first of all, what does a fully sustainable and just and vibrant human presence on this planet look like? And that, of course, has been envisioned by, by many people uh, in, in different forms, of course. But even the more difficult vision is how do we get from where we are to that vision, the, the vision, the envisioning of the transformation of where we are to where we're going. And I like very much what Mikhail said, um, but there is no transformation without disruption. Um, and the idea of the course is to have the students not say that they need to change what they're doing in their lives, whether they're musicians or, or uh, actors or filmmakers or artists uh, or sociologists or anthropologists and say, I need to work in, in climate change. The idea is for them to understand where their talents and their interests fold into 
the work that needs to be done. And again, I, I thought, Mikhail, I thank you very much for this quote from, from Ray Anderson. Uh, and I think it applies to anybody. Uh, can a, a musician or an artist or a filmmaker can come to work to make music or to make a film, or they can come to work to make history. And I think the idea is to help our cultural institutions that exist uh, reframe their um, organizing principles to uh, shift our culture to a place that allows us, allows those values that we claim to hold highest to actually emerge in the institutions that we create. So I guess that's where my thinking is on all of this. And um, thank all of you for listening to a rather uh, rambling um, uh, speech on that. And uh, now, uh, I, I guess, Alice, we're ready for discussion. Thank you. Okay, that was, thanks, Rob. <laughs> I think I, we will shift into, into some discussion, questions, answers. Um, people, I think, are seeing they can use the chat, they can use the Q&A tab, which is also at the bottom of your screens, if you haven't discovered it yet. Um, I want to give a, a question um, to, to both of you, I think, um, in Mikhail and Rob. There's clearly this this challenge, right? This intersection that you're you're talking about of it's just for profit. But you said that a bunch of times, Rob. This has been this has been the, the modus operandi of our society. It's just for profit. Um, and yet, Mikkel, you talk about interface and clearly your organization and pushing the industry. And you, and as you say, you're an upfront for profit company. So how how do we go? forward is it um i'm kind of wondering mikhail what what your response is i guess to to some of that and and then of course this larger big challenge of how do we how do we um act on what we say we want that's what you're saying rob so so um there are some other questions that are coming in and i'll, I'll ask some of those particular ones but but mikhail i just wonder what what your response is on the the kind of for-profit core that seems to be in our society. And yeah, I think it's a very good question. And I, I think, frankly, the, the hypothesis that Interface is testing is that fundamental change can be made from inside the for-profit corporate system that we have. And, and the jury is out as to whether that is actually possible. So I, I don't think we can necessarily say at this point, we have certainly provided some proof points of some pretty fundamental change that has been made even while being a global publicly traded for-profit you know, corporation. Now, is there additional change that needs to be made? Do we run into, in our, our attempts to make transformational change, the boundaries of our system? Absolutely. We would have been able to make some of the changes much more rapidly had we not had to, you know, do quarterly reporting to Wall Street that was showing continuous growth and all these wonderful things that Wall Street expects. But again, the, the challenge that Ray set to us is show that anyone can do it. You know, it's so people, we get the question again, I've, I, you know, oh, are you guys a B Corp or are you guys a benefit corporation? Like, no, we are intentionally not. <laughs> we are intentionally just the same as every other corporation, except we're not. We're doing things that no other corporation is doing, even though we have no special rules, even though we're just the same as any other publicly traded for-profit corporation. We aren't, you know, incorporated in a different way. We aren't incorporated in a way that where well, we have special rules. We're showing that anyone can do it. And that is fundamentally what we see our role in the ecosystem as being. There probably will be new, totally new formulations of how to run business, how to organize people that go far beyond the boundaries of the current you know, for-profit system. Uh, I see our role is to take it as far as we can within the current system. Now we are 
constantly running into the need to change the system, oh my goodness, our business would be transformed if there was any price on carbon. Um, we impose an, a small internal carbon tax. It changes decisions that we make because we have to make these for-profit, you know, hurdle rate investment, ROI decisions every day. Even that tiny little, you know, which essentially we guarantee that any product we sell will be carbon neutral, which means that we have to buy carbon offsets for anything that we sell. Even that small imposition of that carbon tax of, okay, if we decide to make a, a product that has more carbon emissions, we're going to pay a little more for it because of this you know, internal carbon tax. We're going to make it carbon neutral. We're going to zero out that footprint by investing in other carbon reducing or uh, sequestering projects. That has actually changed some of our decisions like, okay, can we afford this new renewable energy system? Well, if we account for the fact that we no longer have to buy the offsets because we no longer have those energy related emissions, if we go renewable, wow, we actually can afford it. We can meet the hurdle rate. So I, I see our role, and I think there's a lot of other roles as a roles for much more fundamental, you know, we need to be testing a lot of hypotheses. It is, you know, I was originally trained in science, and I, I think that is the glorious thing about science is people are out there asking these questions and testing different hypotheses and that's how we truly you know science keeps just when science really works it keeps disrupting itself fundamental stuff like you know newtonian physics which we still teach because it still kind of works we now know to not quite be true you know because there was einstein and then there was quantum physics and all these things keep unfolding um, and that's what we have to do in business we have to keep questioning these assumptions. We have to keep disrupting ourselves. And we have to, I would say, keep disrupting ourselves in this particular direction of what do we truly value and is that being accounted for in our business system? Are the things that we truly want to see grow, growing as we grow our business? Uh, and I think that's the fundamental shift we have to do. And we're gonna, we are working within the system to try to shift that, but it could be that there's gonna be some more fundamental change that has to happen to disrupt this system. Okay, uh, Rob, you, you have a hand. I know there are a couple of questions that tie in with this that are coming in from people as well. Um, so Rob, I don't know if, you're, if you wanna go ahead with yours for a moment in response. Yeah. Rob, you're muted still. <laughs> Thank you. I, I think what Mikhail is saying is, is really interesting and, and um, right along the right tracks. And, what, and the question that arises in my mind, um, and as not someone who's ever tried to run a business of any kind, um, is to what extent, uh, and I guess what comes into my mind is as, as Interface is trying to change their culture from within. Uh, and so we're kind of now relying in our current model on a for-profit corporation to just become enlightened. Um, and what I'm wondering is, how would other shifts in other structures, particularly, say, for example, in this case, regulation and governance, help um, a, a company that is uh, trying to be a little more enlightened in the way they pursue their profit, like, or a lot more, like, like Interface? Um, Mikhail, I'm wondering if you could identify, you know, shifts that could happen outside of your business, uh, maybe in the governance world. Um, or certainly from your customers uh, also just uh, that would help that would help Yeah, I'll, I'll give you one particular example if you remember from the lessons for the future report I pointed out that our our goals for recovering our products and recycling them to make new products have not been nearly what we imagined. It's one of the, the clear, clear goals. We felt short of our 2020 um, aspirations and how we were going to transform our business and one of the big challenges to this kind of circular economy concept is that the whole economy is set up for non-circularity and all the economics incentives are set up to, you know, make oil and gas based raw materials, for instance, which is what we compete against when we're trying to recycle plastics. The cost of recycling that plastics is always up against the cost of producing that same plastic from oil and gas. Of course, we've, especially on the gas side, we're in, a, in an era of never before seen cheapness, <laughs> which makes recycling plastic really challenging. Um, so what we decided to do is we actually decided to go in and we, we worked in the state of California over the last, um, really since 2010, but most actively in the last three years, 
to change the rules, to, to internalize some of the costs of that, to say, if you're going to buy this product carpet, that is a top 10 item in terms of things filling up landfill space, you're going to have to pay a little bit up more up front in order to make sure that that gets recycled. And so we actually took the controversial um, view of lobbying for a tax on our product in order to create a system where there was money in the system to actually get it recycled. So anybody that, that sets up a system to recycle carpet in California now gets paid out of that tax money. Uh, out of that tax money that was collected when it was first sold in the state of California. So currently now you have a, what has now occurred is that most of the rest of the U.S. is at a 1% carpet recycling rate and California is at a 20% carpet recycling rate. And we're seeing all kinds of investment and new technologies for how to turn old carpet into useful stuff. Um, we've certainly managed to get a lot more of our product back to make new product. Um, so just an, uh, an example of where we've started to realize, and we are not experts in lobbying, we don't even have a head of government affairs, but that we need to change the rules of the system and to change if we really want something more fundamental to occur. So we don't see a lot of hope at the federal level at this exact moment, but we are absolutely pursuing. We're also pursuing you know, expansion of, of what's called the Buy Clean uh, California legislation. Um, which essentially incorporates the idea of that the, the embodied carbon, that those greenhouse gas emissions that were required to produce a good must be accounted for in state purchasing decisions. So you can't just outsource your emissions and say, oh, we didn't emit it. California met our greenhouse gas emissions goals because all of our stuff was produced with emissions that came from China. Um, that will not solve climate change. We have to account for all that and make decisions that actually reduce the amount of greenhouse gases going into the environment. Um, there was a wonderful study done by a bunch of uh, public institutions that found that over half of their footprint was not any direct emissions, it was in, in what they were buying. 55% what we purchase, 45% everything else in terms of direct emissions from fleet and energy use and all that traditional scope one and scope two um, so it's one of these things where we have to expand what we're accounting for in terms of how we allocate our money. We also have to put money into these systems if we actually want them to work, which means we need to change the rules. Um, okay, so I'm gonna try, I wanna try and compress a few questions because I think there's some themes here. Um, and Robin, Mikhail, obviously you have access to questions. I think everybody can see the Q&A. There are some that are straightforward about books you mentioned or resources, but, but this one following on what you're talking about now, um, I think, I think there, there are three questions that, that, that have some connection, and then there's another one that's quite different that I also want to ask um, coming from the, the indigenous communities. Um, so in, in thinking about these, the, the, the corporate shift and, and larger societal shift, I think some of these questions about how do we, how do we get to, you know, okay, yes, we need profit, but enough profit as opposed to ex exorbitant profit. And maybe then built in with that, there was a question about um, if they're, you know, within corporations, how do you then, particularly those that are being impacted right now, there's one that's come in from um, the, the the, the conference industry, right? Actually, right, events industry, which is being completely hammered right now is there are no events happening. And so one question was, how, how do you ensure sustainability program remains intact um, if and when labor cuts need, may need to be made? So how do we keep sustainability in this framework? Because it is about people. It's also about employment. It's not just, it, it is environment and our, our impact, but I guess, um, mindset on profit and, and how do we take care of employees, the, the employee aspect. Another question that came in on another several things I'm putting out here um, was about even with interface, or do you have programs, policies that are focused on on the sort of social um, aspect of sustainability with, with your employees? And you can find these particular questions in the Q&A. Um, uh, but I guess, you know, we're in this period of incredible disruption and how do we help shift that toward um, keeping sustainability still in that lens of how we're making these decisions, I guess. Um, 
I'll just take a, a quick stab. Uh, you know, of course, the, the notion is that we, one thing is that you have roadmaps sort of already in place that you can reach for and start moving towards uh, in a crisis. And I, I don't know who said it, somebody probably knows, you know, never let a good crisis go to waste. Um, so here we are with the coronavirus, we're injecting, Congress is now talking about essentially injecting roughly a trillion dollars in stimulus uh, money into the economy, kind of remains to be seen how that gets done. Um, but uh, of course, laying on the shelf for addressing climate change, for example, uh, which, and holistically with other ecological crises, is this, this umbrella notion of the Green New Deal. And so I think as long as we're in this emergency, when clearly there are people who need, uh, uh, I'm, I have the luxury of being employed by a university, which at the moment is still a functioning entity. And so I keep getting paid, as I'm certainly doing work for that, but, but you know, I think of the coffee shops I go to, the restaurants I go to, the um, the travel industry, so many people are simply not gonna, are getting laid off right now. Um, so since we're going to be injecting that money into uh, the nation, let's first make sure I would say it's getting to people. Uh, and to the extent that it get, goes to businesses, the people are talking about bailing out, let's say Boeing, for example, right now. Um, I'd rather not do that. But if that happens, I'd like to do it in a way in which we, the public, have a say over how Boeing restructures and comes back and make sure that as they're rebuilding and reinventing themselves, they're doing it in a way that's consistent with meeting all of these challenges we face. So I, I think we've got some, some, some roadmaps in place. And as we're meeting the current crisis, let's, uh, let's try to implement those roadmaps uh, in a way that synergistically helps the current crisis and takes us uh, more in a direction where we want to go. I would certainly agree with that. We have to, one of the most difficult things in, in looking at these is when we, every time we are spending a big chunk of money, whether it's, as, as I said, at the level of institutional purchasing, but certainly in terms of federal government spending or spending on infrastructure, if we are investing in the wrong thing, we are going to be you know, making a, a lasting mistake. Whereas if we invest in the right thing, and this is you know, on the manufacturing side, fundamentally the, the biggest mistake you can make on the manufacturing side is to build the wrong machine. Because then the rules of the game dictate that you then need to run to feed and run that machine as efficiently and as long as possible in order to get back your cost of capital you invested in it. So if you build a machine, for instance, that can only run on non-renewable energy, you've just invested in non-renewable energy for the life of that machine, which in manufacturing could be a couple decades. If you invest in a machine that can only run virgin inputs, you know, petrochemical plastics and others, you have invested in petrochemical plastic infrastructure for the foreseeable future. Um, so we have to, you know, it's same when we, when we build a, a waste energy incinerator, we now have an incentive to burn more stuff. Um, whereas, you know, what, what we've been doing and what we're in the process of doing is building machines that only work with recycled materials. And then we got to go figure out, you know, and we've been doing this in conjunction, how do we get more of these recycled or rapidly renewable bio-based materials? Um, because we now have to feed that machine. We've set up the incentives properly. And that to me is, is the power of business. If, if we get our incentives aligned with what we actually want, again, going back to what Rob said about structures, business can be this very powerful structure if we set it up right. Um, but if we get the incentives wrong, it can be a very powerful in, in, incentive and structure to do the wrong things over and over again at scale. All right, people are frozen, it's making me worry. Alice, can you confirm that you can hear me? Yeah. Alice, I, you're, I, there you I go. Can, I can hear you. Um, we, I, I closed my video for a minute just to see if that helped with the, the audio, but we can hear you, you're fine. There was a little okay. bit of warbling Good. for a minute, but it's all right. Um, 
And just quickly on the social side, I think, I think one of the wonderful things about the current disruption, you know, as much as it's not wonderful, is that it really is going to show you who are the leaders, who are the leaders in taking care of, of people and really seeing what matters. Um, because it is going to be a series of really difficult decisions. Uh, it's obviously going to have a huge impact on the economy. Um, and it's going to force people to make really tough decisions. And I think it's going to reveal something about culture and leadership um, in the people who are going to have to make these tough decisions. I know we're, we just had to close our factory for five days. Um, and we are going to do everything we can you know to to really show what we're made of during this crisis and to show our people that we are are standing together um during this crisis because it, this is what reveals character i i absolutely agree with you um i wanted i wanted to vo voice a question just in case participants hadn't seen it that's coming because i think it's a critical one and something that we, we had intended to also be core to this session originally. So the um, American Indian Council at Weber State, who's listening in, asked about, you know, they say, how would the academy incorporate? I would say, how would our society writ large um, incorporate indigenous knowledge and ways of thinking um, into the classroom was their question. But I also think we, we could think, ask that question of what society writ large um, because, as they noted, what has been stated in the presentations both you and, and Rob gave really aligns with indigenous ways of being and, the, as they say, the responsibility of reciprocity with all beings and elements. And I think that is um, ultimately what we're getting at, right? How do we be that society we want to be? As you're saying, Mikkel, how, how do we keep that lens in our in these leaders who rise to the fore and keep keep that in their leadership, I think that's something we all are going to be wrestling with. So you know, I'm I'm glad to hear your. I'm sure your company is going to be trying to walk the walk as much as you can as in taking care of people um, in this crisis as well. <clears throat> and I'm glad we have that perspective in here because I was looking forward to discussing this with with Edward and. and I know. Um, but I mentioned the book Ishmael by Daniel Quinn. And as much as I would say overall, there's, <laughs> there's little direct connection between what Interface has done and, and, and the indigenous wisdom, other than the fact that if you read Daniel Quinn very carefully, what he's saying is that we have to go back to this point where we took a fork away from indigenous wisdom and go and question, you know, humanity lived in, in tribes that had these certain common sort of core cultural characteristics as much as were very diverse, distinct from what is today the dominant culture, they had different assumptions, for instance, about our relationship to other species. Um, there was this, this divergence of mainstream culture that is not, no longer, we're not talking about Chinese culture or German culture or, or American culture, they all actually fit within this one macro culture. And so then it becomes really interesting to say, who has maintained stuff that didn't all take this big left turn um, culturally? And I think that's where you start to look back at indigenous wisdom and say, wow, there's some totally different assumptions built into this that we need to go back and <laughs> learn from. <laughs> um, because this turn that we've taken has been this real interesting experiment in a certain kind of civilization that doesn't appear to be working out in certain ways. So if we want to change course, who can we learn from? And one of the obvious places to look at is you know, where there is extent in surviving indigenous wisdom. That is this treasure trove of, of, of cultural um, wisdom that we all need to learn from. Um, I think that was really well said and I, uh, I want to, um, am I coming through? Yes. Yeah, okay. Um, I want to say, first of all, I, you know, I, um, other than having grown up in South Dakota, which has a, a quite a strong indigenous uh, history and population, I, I, I claim no particular expertise on what exactly indigenous cultures are. So with that caveat, I'll say that my perception of it is 
um, not unfounded, I think, is that it heavily recognizes the concept of community much more so than we currently do here in the United States, where we seem to be still clinging to this, you know, myth of the individual um, and prizing personal freedom and, and um, uh, you know, that and sort of uh, personal achievement. Uh, my understanding of indigenous culture is a, a much stronger prizing of community, the concept of community, and not just the community of the people, but, but that community includes uh, includes nature as being um, the, the wildlife, the, the land, the water, all being a part of that community. And I certainly, certainly believe that this uh, is where we need to go if we are to then have institutions to emerge to value those things as well. And those, and, and you know, the, the notion that we can make rules um, all we want. Uh, and even put the force of, of law behind them. But if they're not consistent with what we're actually choosing to value, they don't hold very well, right? I mean, we find ways around the rules. We find ways to, to skirt them. You're never going to, your people are always going to cheat if they feel like they're sort of entitled to cheat or they're encouraged to cheat. It, but that becomes much less prevalent if the culture is very much in line with the rules that we make. Um, so, uh, to actually answer the, the question directly, which is asking about what can we do within the, the academy, the universities, um, uh, I'm working at Utah State University, which is a land-grant institution, which was, uh, you know, we have one in every state, and in fact, every institution I've ever studied at has been a land-grant institution, starting with South Dakota State University, um, go Jackrabbits. Uh, I moved to Texas A&M University for a year, uh, and then some years later came to Utah State University. All of these are land-grant institutions created with the, the notion of connecting our society to the knowledge that we have. And I'm, I'm actually uh, part of a, a movement uh, that we're spearheading starting here at Utah State University and including all of the land-grant universities, which is to try to get ourselves to... Um, make addressing these grand challenges and shifting our culture in a way that can do that, uh, essentially our organizing principle. So I, I, I personally believe that shift has to happen within our educational institutions. And I think the land grant universities are the perfect place to start um, for that to happen. And the model for that very much in my mind is at least my perception of what indigenous culture is. Uh, so that's, I guess, how I would answer that. I'm just trying. Three minutes, right? I'm trying to figure out where 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 to go next on our questions. There's so many great questions, Rob and Dave, um, Rob and Mikhail. I don't know if you have um, taken a look at the Q and A at all. Um, I've typed in a few answers to the ones that are a little more straightforward to answer. Some of them kind of <laughs> demand a larger discussion and are harder to type a quick answer to. Is, is there one you want to take just live right now? That you, because that you, there were a couple of quick ones that you probably have answered. Yeah, let me. Uh, there were a couple on um, your company, particularly, and sort of how you respond or what the response has been with other corporations you work with. Um, oh, here's 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 one. I I'd be it's it's on the list, and I'd be interested in Mikhail's response. Go for it. Uh, it's from Quinn. It says carbon offsetting. I'm curious. Does Interface have a standard for investigating carbon offsetting groups and ensuring that they're offsetting in the way they say they are? and that they claimed offsets are continuous. Let me know if that question is unclear. <laughs> okay, so the question is, is sort of the, the viability and the reliability of carbon offsetting. Yeah, so I see uh, carbon offsets very much as a bridge strategy. You know, ultimately we have to work on, on more fundamental changes, but at the same time, if we started to require things to be carbon neutral for the, the mindset shift, I believe, and this is fundamentally what I got in the very first talk I heard Ray Anderson give, is traditionally for-profit companies come in and say, we wanna be responsible for as little as possible beyond our own profits. 
Ray Anderson came in and said, we want to be responsible for our entire impact of our company so that we take it from being to really being responsible for these negative impacts, which is something you can, you can start to do with carbon offsets to ultimately having being responsible for having a positive impact. So in carbon offsets, what you're essentially doing, the way that carbon offsets become radical rather than greenwash is when you require your purchases to be carbon neutral at no additional cost. Someone else asked a question about, well, what can small businesses do you know, when the sustainable options are, are less affordable? The work for all of us in sustainable business is to make the sustainable option more affordable, to make it, you know, as you know, make doing the right thing as easy as falling off a log. I think that's uh, that's a Paul Hawken quote. Um, but that is fundamentally the work. When we run into a situation within Interface where the more sustainable option costs more and cannot be justified within our for-profit framework, that's a, a flag not to give up, but to innovate and to reconcile that 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 gap. Um, so carbon offsets in the meantime, or, or when we run into that gap and we can't yet innovate it, we can't eliminate, um, you know, for instance, we can't eliminate the use of power to vacuum carpet. We offset that. We offset, you know, seven years of vacuuming our carpet before we even sell it to you uh, because we consider ourselves to be responsible for that. You bought carpet for this particular, you know, function it performs. You didn't by the footprint. That's our responsibility. And that's where it becomes radical. So to answer your specific question, of course, if you want to be radical, they have, these offsets have to matter. Um, there's about three different levels of verification you go through. You have to have the actual pro product or the actual project onsite audited. So there's a number of great standards you can look to. Carbon Action Reserve, um, Verified Carbon Standard, VCS, CAR, um, Gold Standard. We'll accept any of those for um, carbon offsets that we put as part of our carbon neutral floors promise. Um, and then those are often bundled by, by in between players that do their own audits as to whether those are legitimate offsets. Uh, and then of course, in order to get the carbon neutral claim, we have to have that audited where they say, okay, show us the detailed accounting of your carbon footprint for the full life cycle of your product and did you purchase enough of these high quality offsets to truly zero that out to make it carbon neutral um, so we there's about three layers of of auditing there depending on whether you have a middle person um but this bundler uh, that it has to go through because yeah it doesn't it doesn't matter if it's a fake offset if it's something that was going to happen anyway or it's not additional um, but the great thing about it, and a wonderful you know, Ray Anderson quote, well, most of Ray Anderson's best quotes sound like truisms, but they're actually profound. He said, but basically, what if everyone did it? What if everyone was required to be responsible for their entire carbon footprint of the product they're selling you? How many amazing, cool local projects would have tons of money being thrown at them you know, all of these people, you know, there's these fundamental things. There's, there's people all over the world who have to, to burn something to boil water because there's no clean water. If you provide them with water filters, they don't have to burn that full. Um, suddenly we have a carbon offset, which by the way, is keeping people from dying of waterborne illnesses. So if those sorts of projects were something that suddenly every company was scrambling to have to find to invest in some carbon savings for something they couldn't yet eliminate from their supply chain, that would be a pretty cool world to live in. You know, we would suddenly have plenty of money to keep forests standing or to keep, you know, forests being regenerated. Um, so carbon offsets, I think, if you do them right, are surprisingly transformational, um, but they're not the whole story. Your whole sustainability story can't be, we've paid someone else to, you know, to get rid of our sins. So uh, I'm actually interested in, in um, this bit though, so right now you said, what if everybody did it? What if everyone were required to uh, buy carbon offsets? And um, so that's kind of a, 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 an enforced structural change. We've got government regulation. But uh, what the, the thought that often I keep running into is just how much more effective these things are, if not only if everybody were required to do it, all the CEOs and all the employees in the companies, but particularly the management. But what if everyone wanted to do it? 
And it's that notion of, of, of sort of building into our society structures that, that start to build that desire to do these things, um, even if they're hard, even if they cost something up front, uh, along with the, you know, the requirement. Um, I kind of feel like right now your interface is, and I think you've said as much, Mikhail, is swimming upstream. You know, you have your, the systems around you are fighting you at every turn. And um, so along with these efforts that are happening in companies like Interface, and there are a few others uh, that are trying it, if the systems that they were embedded in were actually encouraging them to do it, uh, and that that encouragement was actually coming from a culture that was uh, sort of coming along and coming up through the people who are leading uh, uh, these companies. I, I mean, I, I certainly agree, and I and I think they're what Daniel Quinn likes to talk about is how we keep wanting to change the programs and to keep changing the little rules and and little pieces and have new programs. And fundamentally, programs don't matter without a mindset shift. Unless we change the direction of the river, all of these things are going to be little sort of, you know, you know, bundles of sticks that eventually get washed away. You know, we, we put a lot of effort into building them and then, but we're still fundamentally, the river's still running the wrong direction. And so I do agree with that. I think where we have to start with this shift, and again, it goes to structures, there are people who have begun to shift their minds who are saying, you know, and we, we've been working with a number of different groups. You know, on, on one side, we work with a lot of architects and designers in green building who want to design greener buildings but they don't necessarily have the structures to make that easy and doable. Um, and so part of it, I think, is to start to create these structures that align people that already have these values are not necessarily even acting on them yet. And so I think the low hanging fruit here culturally is to start to, to show that these different ways of doing things can be done by people who already start to have these ideas and to start to build some momentum and to start to show I fundamentally think that what is going to have to happen in the face of disruption is that people are going to have to look and see that someone else has already figured out a better way to do it. Now that the old way, the business as usual, has been disrupted, they're going to look over there and say, whoa, you know, buildings that actually suck CO2 out of the atmosphere. You know, that seems like a good idea. You know, you know, communities that function in different ways, that value different things, wow, they seem to be happier and more productive and, and everything else, you know, I should check that out. But I think fundamentally the work we, we need to do in Culture Shift right now has to do with designing, creating these better ways that are obviously better, that as business as usual gets disrupted, we can say, hey, we've already got, you know, a solution right here that you might want to be part of. And so we've already got some people, you know, we have a community of people that are doing purchasing. Again, even before the government acts to change the rules, we have people that already care in purchasing. We're working with the Sustainable Purchasing Leadership Council, among others, to look at, okay, so we are, we buy stuff every day. Can we buy stuff in a way that actually supports our values? Can we move all of this money in the direction of these companies that are creating this next economy that really grows the right things as these companies grow? If we shift our money, even within today's, you know, limits of today's economy and rules toward these things that we want to see grow, those are going to be more mature, more developed when the rest of the economy and the rest of the, the people, you know, when the rest of the thinking and the culture starts to shift, we're going to have these solutions much better developed and people are going to have, you know, hate this metaphor, but there are going to be lifeboats already upside uh, alongside the Titanic. And some of them are going to be pretty fabulous and you're going to be happy to jump off the Titanic. Um, but we have to start investing now in that. Mikhail, I'm going to have to mind the time because I, I don't want us to all get cut off all of a sudden. Um, we are, we are just about at our time limit. Um, and I wanted to thank both of you so much for participating in this. And I wanted to thank all the participants. We hit, I think, 193 or something for this session, um, which is marvelous. Uh, as I said, um, our session at the next session was canceled, the 12 o'clock, but I hope folks will go get lunch, um, walk around, see the sunshine if it's shining or whatever is happening where you are and um, come back and hear Hunter Lovins at one o'clock with us. We'll also have some conversation time then. 
and I also wanted to be sure to thank, because I didn't earlier, the, all of the participants, speakers, exhibitors, volunteers, and our incredible staff um, in sustainability here at Weber State for working to, to put the summit together as, as was planned. Um, we have an incredible team, particularly Bonnie and Chase uh, as our chief coordinators. So um, I know there were other questions we didn't quite get to. If this stays open for a minute, we might be able to type some, but, but I'm gonna kind of officially wrap us up here. And thank you so much, Mikhail and Rob. Yeah, I'll be happy to type in some answers to the questions. Okay, thanks. Yes. Thank you, everybody. And uh, we will officially end, but, but I'm gonna leave it in case we can type a few answers up for Mikhail and Rob as they do that. Thank you, everyone. Stay healthy, stay connected. <laughs> yes, indeed. Let's build some great lifeboats. <laughs>